Good morning. It's May 7th. We are so happy to welcome virtually Professor Brad Snyder. Let me tell you a little bit about him. <clears throat> I have things right. Here we go. Professor Snyder teaches constitutional law, constitutional history, and sports law. Oh, I didn't even know the sports law. We'll have to ask you back for that. He is the author of, of the book, Dem um, Democratic Justice, Felix Frankfurter, The Supreme Court and the Making of the Liberal Establishment. He has published law review articles in the Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Law Review, Notre Dame Law Review, Law and History Review, UC Davis Law Review, and Boston College Law Review, and is the author of The House of Truth, A Washington Political Salon, and The Foundations of American Liberalism. Professor Snyder worked as an associate at Williams and Connolly and wrote two critically acclaimed books about baseball, including A Well-Paid Slave, Kurt Flood's, oh, my mom's on this uh, call, and she's from St. Louis, Kurt Flood's Fight for a Free Agency in Professional Sports. So with no further ado, <clears throat> come back to this, uh, we welcome you, and we'll be taking questions at the end. And... Uh, Professor Snyder, please. Well, thanks. You can call me Brad. Um, Vanessa, only my students call me um, Professor Snyder. So um, everybody um, should just call me Brad. And um, Vanessa, really, I'm really delighted to be here and really appreciative for the opportunity. I grew up at, in a reform congregation um, that um, in Washington, um, D.C., that just so happened uh, to be on Macomb Street, um, smell, spelled differently than your synagogue, but Washington Hebrew um, is on Macomb Street in, in um, Northwest DC. So um, the, made your, the name of your synagogue made me think of my um, home congregation. And for those of you who thought you were getting Brad Schneider, your congressman, I cannot answer um, your constituent questions. I apologize. Um, but if you are interested in um, the role of the Supreme Court in American democracy, um, I can really help you um, with that topic. Let me just give you a little background before I share my screen um, with some slides about um, Felix Frankfurter. I've been work I worked on this book for about five to seven years, and um, before I taught at Georgetown, I was a law professor at the University of Wisconsin. And I would say to all of my students during that time at Wisconsin um, that um, having a democracy decide all of our key constitutional issues, such as abortion, affirmative action or what have you, by what does Justice Anthony Kennedy think? And Anthony Kennedy, of course, um, at the time, um, was um, the sort of quote unquote swing justice um, on the Supreme Court who um, sort of wielded a lot of power, um, whether the decisions were five for one way or five for the other way. And I said, that's a crazy way to run a democracy um, by having both sides um, try to pitch um, their point of view um, to Anthony Kennedy. and and. So, um, and really where all of this came from for me is I graduated from law school um, shortly before um, Bush versus Gore, um, which is when the Supreme Court ruled five to four um, that the state of Florida's recount um, violated the Equal Protection Clause. And, but um, this was, the court tended not to intervene in presidential elections and the court's opinion suggested um, that this equal pr protection rationale um, was really good, good only for that case. And it was a really unusual decision. And it really, I thought, short-circuited um, the democratic political process and really the, the state of Florida's ability to recount the votes. Um, and I don't think it would have changed the outcome in the election had the state of, re of Florida um, been allowed to continue its recount. Um, but I really think the Supreme Court did a lot of damage to itself. And it caused me to question my, um, my thinking about the role of the Supreme Court in American democracy. And so um, flash forward to about 2006 or 2007, um, I was writing a law review article about um, Julius Nethel Rosenberg. Um, two atomic spies um, who were sentenced to death um, for espionage and, and, and executed and, and, you know, left two young children, um, you know, who um, grew up without parents. And um, the Supreme Court never heard the merits on whether their trials um, violated um, the U.S. Constitution. Um, the justices were deeply divided about whether to hear the case. Um, they ended up hearing it on the 11th hour. Um, on an issue about whether or not the Rosenbergs had been tried under the wrong federal law. Um, but 
but the fairness of the trial and the fairness of some of the evidence uh, and the witness um, testimony and whether evidence was uh, manufactured or perjured was never brought before the court. And um, Felix Frankfurter wrote a dissent after um, the Rosenbergs had been executed. And he, he basically said, history has its claims. We got this one wrong. Um, but don't lose faith in the Supreme Court and don't lose faith in the rule of law. And that dissent, um, was he was really writing to his law clerks and to his students who had really lost faith I'm in the Supreme Court of the United States, kind of in the way um, that I had lost faith um, at, in the court after Bush versus Gore. Um, and, and so um, I really started to dig into Frankfurter's jurisprudence. And, and Frankfurter's big idea was that judicial restraint is a liberal constitutional theory, um, that um, the court um, in deferring to the elected branches is going to promote um, liberal ideas. And but during the, the Warren court era, um, his liberal colleagues um, really disagreed um, with that idea. And Frankfurter became portrayed for a really long time as this kind of cons liberal um, lawyer turned conservative justice and villain on the Warren court. And so let me just read you a paragraph that I wrote recently um, to a group of scholars, OK, because I think it sort of encapsulates um, the big idea in my book. It says, we are living in the middle of Felix Frankfurter's I told you so moment. He warned us that the Warren court was a liberal aberration, that the Supreme Court of the United States was a historically reactionary, backward-looking institution, and that the American people should not outsource democratic policymaking to an unelected, politically accountable, unaccountable federal judiciary. The court is waist high in the political thicket and American democracy is worse off for it. For more than 25 years, the Supreme Court has ignored the political question doctrine to interfere with the state's recount in a presidential election, shown little or no respect for longstanding precedent, ignored standing mootness, ripeness, and other passive virtues, invented non-textual limits on federal power, such as the congruence and proportionality test, equal sovereignty principle, major questions doctrine, weaponized the First Amendment, and repeatedly invoked a single line from Marbury versus Madison to justify its own self-empowerment. So uh, that, that gives you a sense of Frankfurter's sort of distrust in some way of judicial power. And I'm, I'm in this slide presentation that I'm going to show, um, I'm going to try to explain both Frankfurter's incredible American Jewish immigrant story, and also um, how he came um, to distrust uh, the Supreme Court of the United States. So let me um, make an attempt here to share my screen, which I know how to do, but um, let me just try this real quick. Can everybody see that? And I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to play it from the start. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, Vanessa, you're muted, but I got, I got it. So I got the sense that you're that you can it's see. It's perfect. It. Very Great. good. So um, I just explained to you a little bit with some legalese about um, why Felix Frankfurter considered judicial restraint a, a liberal constitutional theory. And I want to tell you how he get, got there. First of all, Frankfurter grew up in, in Vienna, Austria until age 11. Um, he didn't, when he came to the um, America, his big hero in Austria was his uncle Solomon, who was a a librarian and a philologist, a big scholar at the University of Vienna and a large, I would say, a public intellectual. And I'm, I'm going to get back to his uncle Solomon in, in a minute. Um, he moves to the United States um, with his family in 1894. Um, he could not speak a word of English and he had never um, heard one spoken. His father um, came over first. And then um, this is um, the manifest showing his mother, Emma, um, his brothers, um, Otto and Siegfried. There's Felix. Um, highlighted in yellow, and Paul and his um, second youngest sister, um, Ella, um, on that manifest. Um, a, a key moment for Frankfurter when he arrives is he goes to PS 25 um, in um, Lower Manhattan. It's a German-speaking neighborhood. Um, his teacher, um, Miss Hogan, threatens his German-American students um, and says and threatens them with corporal punishment um, if they speak to Frankfurter in his native German and he um, credits Miss Hogan um, with his rapid um, assimilation in this country and ability to learn English. By the time he graduates from elementary school, he's salutatorian of his class. 
Um, he enters the free um, combined high school and college program at CCNY. And here's a picture of him in the middle in yellow um, at CCNY. He graduates third in his class at age 19. Um, he works for a year um, in New York City um, for um, a welfare department and a housing and the tenement house department um, in particular. Um, he makes a couple of stabs at going to other law schools in New York. Um, he attended um, NYU and, and New York Law School for just a bit. He didn't like them very much. He dropped out. And he was all ready to um, submit his um, tuition money, his deposit to Columbia um, when a friend of his, the Tenement House Department, said, you should go to Harvard. And in those days, anybody could get into Harvard Law School um, who had done well in college, um, but it was really hard to stay in. A third of the class um, in those days in Harvard Law School um, flunked out. Let me see, my slides aren't moving along here. There we go. Um, so um, Felix goes to Harvard in his second year at Harvard Law School. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States um, decides a case called Lochner versus New York. And this is a description of it. Um, Lochner was a case um, about a, Mac a New York state law about um, maximum hours for bakers. And it said that um, people who owned bake shops um, could not um, employ their em employees um, and contract for their employees for more than 50 hours um, in a single week. And the Supreme Court struck down that law um, as violating the freedom of contract um, between employers and employees. And the Lochner decision sort of symbolized kind of judicial activism um, and judicial policy making, and, and really be, um, became um, the kind of label that was attached to the period between 1905 to 1936 um, that was known as the Lochner era um, because the Supreme Court of the United States um, was very hostile to state and federal economic legislation. So, so this decision obviously was a had a huge impact on Frankfurter. Um, the other thing that had a huge impact on Frankfurter was a law review article um, by a Harvard law professor um, named James Bradley Thayer. Now Thayer had died by the time Frankfurter attended Harvard Law School, um, but he his ideas were dominant at the school. And his big idea was as follows. That was in, when the Supreme Court reviews a federal law um, and decides whether it's constitutional or not, it should only overturn that federal law if it's unconstitutional beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So importing a kind of criminal jury standard um, into the Supreme Court's decision-making. And, and so Thayer was really kind of the godfather of the idea of judicial restraint. And, and Frankfurter really kind of glommed on to, to Thayer's ideas and, and considered himself a disciple of Thayer's um, for the rest of his life. 1906, um, Frankfurter um, finishes first in his class at Harvard Law School, um, had a remarkable career there, and couldn't find a job. Um, because in those days, um, Wall Street law firms didn't hire Jews. Um, he finally gets a job um, with a law, law firm. He, he, and even though one of the partners says, you should really change your name from Frankfurter because it's really funny sounding. He goes to the law firm. He doesn't change his name. And after a few months, he leaves because he gets a call um, from the U.S. attorney in the Southern District um, in Lower Manhattan, a man named Henry Stimson, who's um, third from the left on the bottom there with a mustache and glasses. Um, and Henry Stimson calls him and he wants Frankfurter to be an assistant United States attorney. And Frankfurter accepts. Stimson had been charged with then President um, Theodore Roosevelt with busting trusts, in particular the Sugar Trust, um, which was engaged in all types of illegal activity in cornering the sugar market in the United States. Frankfurter goes to the U.S. Attorney's Office, prosecutes the Sugar Trust with Stimson, and really becomes close friends um, with Theodore Roosevelt on a first name basis with the former president. Um, after he leaves office, um, when Stimson runs for governor unsuccessfully. Um, after Stimson leaves the U.S. Attorney's Office, he loses the go governor's race. Um, the next president, William, William Howard Taft, um, makes Stimson the Secretary of War. Stimson brings Frankfurter down to Washington um, as his um, sort of counsel. And Frankfurter lives in this house um, with other young um, sort of Teddy Roosevelt 
partisans, right? Bull moosers, um, they would call themselves um, during the 1912 election. Um, they were all progressive and um, they created at this house in DuPont Circle, um, right near Kramer Books, um, north of the circle, if you've ever been to Kramer Books in Washington, D.C. Um, and they created a political salon and they would invite a who's who of um, intellectuals across the political spectrum to come speak to them. Um, the founders of the New Republic um, really founded their magazine out of that house. Um, this is an invitation um, to the founding of the New Republic. If you notice, um, it was called the Republic at the time, and they realized that name had been taken. So they changed it to the New Republic. And, and Frankfurter was one of the founding incorporators of that magazine and, and one of the early contributors to it. At this political salon, um, Frankfurter be befriends two of his judicial heroes, both who agree with Thayer in the idea of judicial restraint. And on the left is um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., um, who was really the hero of the House of Truth. And on the right um, is Louis Brandeis, um, who was then um, a prominent lawyer in Boston and who was really in sympathy with the progressive ideas of the people in the House. And so some of the big ideas of the people in the House um, were um, organized labor as a way of creating um, an industrial democracy and also um, kind of state minimum wage and maximum hour laws um, to level the playing field um, between um, labor and management. Frankfurter meets his um, future wife, um, a, a, the daughter of a minister, Marion Denman, and the president of her class at Smith College um, at the House of Truth at one of these dinners. In 1914, um, he returns to Cambridge um, as the first um, Jewish professor um, on the Harvard Law faculty. And for those um, lawyers in the audience and sort of legal historians in the audience, um, Roscoe Pound is um, a third from the left um, on that um, with the mustache and the glasses um, all, all on this picture. And he and Frankfurter were friends early on and became adversaries later on. And I'll try to explain um, why. In 1916, um, Frankfurter and a young reporter for the um, New Republic, Walter Littman, lead the charge after Brandeis gets nominated as the first Jewish justice um, on the Supreme Court. There was all of this opposition. It was a really protracted confirmation fight. And it's Frankfurter and Littman writing editorials in the New Republic um, that are sort of responding to all of the allegations against Brandeis. And that brings Frankfurter um, extremely close um, to Brandeis. And from then on, um, Frankfurter and Brandeis become allies in a number of different causes. Neither Frankfurter or Brandeis are observant Jews. Um, Frankfurter left the synagogue in 19, at the age of 15 and never went back. Um, but um, both of them, and at, Fra at Brandeis's urging, um, become really active Zionists. And there were not a lot of active um, Zionists um, in the United States at the time. And, and Brandeis really became the de facto leader of the American Zionist movement, and Frankfurter became his chief um, lieutenant. Um, during World War I, Frankfurter went back um, into the federal government, first with the War Department, and then with the Department of Labor. Um, he wrote um, a report about something called the Bisbee, Bisbee deportations, um, which um, basically um, was an attempt um, by, to bust um, unionization of minors, um, in New Mexico and Arizona, and um, and he really clashed with Theodore Roosevelt. Um, Theodore Roosevelt called Frankfurter's report. Frankfurter was the author of this report um, on behalf of the Labor Department Bolsheviki, and, and and Roosevelt's letter was reprinted in newspapers all over the country. Um, to Frankfurter's credit, he did not split with Roosevelt. Um, after this um, clash over the Bisbee deportation report, um, and they remained on good terms until the end of Roosevelt's life. Um, in 1919. Once Brandeis joins the court, he hands off his really important constitutional cases to Frankfurter, and Frankfurter is the one charged with defending minimum wage and maximum hour laws before the Supreme Court of the United States um, in 1916 and 1917, and it's, he succeeds in getting those laws upheld. Um, these are Oregon laws. In 1919, after the war, Frankfurter leaves the Labor Department and he goes um, to P Paris for the peace conference um, on a mission for the American Zionist movement to try to get the, the big five countries um, in Paris to carve out a Jewish state in Palestine. And he negotiates an agreement um, with the leader 
of um, the Arab representative, Prince Faisal, who's there on the right, um, that the, the, the goals of the Arabs and the Jews are aligned against um, imperialist um, Ottoman Empire, who had really persecuted both groups. And so they wrote um, this document, and they both signed it with the help of um, T. E. Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia was the translator for Prince Faisal, um, that, that the Jews and the Palestinians could create one Palestine complete. Um, together. And, and um, that obviously failed um, the efforts to carve a Jewish state out of Palestine um, in 1919. Frankfurter um, played a trump card in trying to make that happen at the last minute. Um, he begged Louis Brandeis during the summer of 1919 to go to Palestine and report back on what he found. This is a picture of Brandeis in Palestine um, that I got from, um, uh, from Israel. And um, um, people said that Brandeis's appearance almost changed. He was a changed man in Palestine. And he, he reported back to Frankfurter um, that, that Palestine was even better than what he'd heard, that it was another California. And he, uh, um, he and Frankfurter envisioned Palestine um, as a Jewish state and as a um, laboratory of liberal democracy. So I'm going to just show you that picture of Brandeis versus this picture of Brandeis. They look totally different, right? I love this picture of Brandeis. So after 1919, Frankfurter returns to Harvard Law School. And a really seminal moment for him is in 1923, where he's defending a, a Washington, D.C. minimum wage law for women and children. And um, it takes a really long time for this case to make its way um, through the federal courts and through the D.C. courts. And finally, in 1923, um, the Supreme Court of the United States strikes down this law as violating the liberty of contract. People thought that Lochner versus New York was dead, that it had been overruled by those other cases that Frankfurter had defended in 1916 and 1917. But um, Atkins versus Children's Hospital revived Lochner, revived the idea of freedom of contract um, between um, employees and employers, even though that is no way, nowhere mentioned um, in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment and really led the Supreme Court's um, hostility to economic legislation. Frankfurter never argued another Supreme Court case after Atkins versus Children's Hospital. And instead, um, from his perch at Harvard Law School, he became the foremost critic um, of a very anti-labor, anti-regulation um, Supreme Court of the United States. Um, Frankfurter becomes um, pegged as kind of this radical, um, during the 1920s. And the main reason why he becomes a rat, pegged as a radical during the 1920s is in 1927, um, he um, writes a book um, about um, the trial of two Italian anarchists, um, Bartolomeo Vanzetti on um, the left and Nicola Zacco, Sacco on the right. And, and he argues that they had received, an, uh, they had been railroaded and they had really been convicted, um, not based on the evidence, but because of their anarchist political beliefs and because of their immigrant status. And um, he basically becomes, he Frankfurter becomes the enemy, not Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, he publishes this book while the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts is considering um, the, whether or not to overturn their convictions. Um, but Frankfurter really wanted the people of Massachusetts to make up their mind about the fairness of the trial. And so he wrote this book and Frankfurter becomes public enemy number one in Boston. Um, he becomes shunned um, by the Brahmin class in Boston, even his editor at the Atlantic Monthly, where he initially published an article that became the book, um, met with him in far out, far away hotels in Boston and out of the way locations. So as not to be seen with Frankfurter, um, he would never have invited Frankfurter to one of his exclusive private clubs because um, Frankfurter was that much of an outcast in Boston. At the same time, Frankfurter really threw himself into electoral politics. Um, he had given up on the court as a means of political change. Um, in 1924, um, he supported the third party candidate for president, fighting Bob La Follette, running under the Progressive Party ticket. In 1928, um, he was a big supporter of Al Smith's um, Democrat, who was the Democratic nominee and the first Catholic nominee for president um, in 1928. Um, on the right is a picture of Frankfurter and Al Smith um, together. 
And, um, you know, he didn't sort of lose faith I mean, this democratic political process, even though um, La Follette and Smith lost badly. And Walter Lippmann, his kind of friend who eventually becomes his frenemy for reasons I'll explain, um, Walter Lippmann kind of said, it's over after Al Smith loses. The Democratic Party's over. Um, you know, liberalism can't survive in electoral politics. And Frankfurter said, you're wrong. Um, there's this young governor of New York who squeaked out his race um, for governor at the same time Al Smith, the former governor of New York, got trounced and lost the state of New York, and his name is Franklin Roosevelt. And Frankfurter becomes um, a big advisor of FDRs as governor of New York, um, and um, and and really um, becomes a huge believes that not only believes two things they're really controversial at the time. One. He believes that the Democratic Party is going to be the liberal party in this country. And at the time in 28, um, there are a lot of liberals in the Republican Party, and there are a lot of liberals in the Democratic Party, and there are a lot of really conservative Southern Democrats in the Republican Party. And so that was a controversial statement. The second thing he believed was that Frank, that FDR is the future leader of the Democratic Party. Walter Lippmann did not agree. Walter Lippmann thought FDR was a lightweight. And he tried in um, the New York Herald Tribune, um, and he wrote a column in January of 1932 calling FDR a lightweight. And he said he was unfit to be president of the United States. Uh, and that was kind of the first break between, major break between Walter Lippmann and Frankfurter. Of course, um, FDR gets elected um, at the height of the Great Depression over Herbert Hoover. Frankfurter becomes his chief outside advisor. I say this um, um, and and with no value judgment here, but he was really the Steve Bannon of the of of the Roosevelt administration, right? This outside advisor. If you want to go back a century, he's Colonel House's, he's Woodrow Wilson's Colonel House, right? This outside advisor um, with no job within the administration. Uh, FDR wanted Frankfurter to be his Solicitor General. He offered him the job to be the Solicitor General and um, representing the United States before the Supreme Court in Frankfurter turned him down cold and said, I can do more for you on the outside. And FDR pleaded with him. He said, look, I want to put you on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, most people just know you as this guy who wrote this book about Sacco and Vanzetti. If you become the Solicitor General, it's much easier for me to get you on the court and get you confirmed. And Frankfurter said, no, I can help you more. Um, do, uh, from the outside, the Solicitor General job is a full-time job. I can't possibly do the things you need me to do um, while doing that full-time job. So he advised Roosevelt. Um, he helps defeat um, John J. Parker's nomination to the Supreme Court under Hoover. But the real thing Frankfurter does all through his time as Harvard Law School is he tells his law students, don't go work at big law firms. He says, don't go work at firms um, in Boston, in New York, in Chicago. He says, the highest possible thing you can do, the highest form of service you can do is enter, enter the federal government. And so Frankfurter becomes um, this recruiter or talent scout for every presidential administration from Taft's onward and, and sends people into the federal government, right? Really, Wilson's onward. I mean, he starts sending people in Taft, but he joins the Harvard faculty during Wilson. And, and really, by the time FDR becomes president, he has dozens and dozens and dozens of former students in the federal government. But when the New Deal happens, there's all these new administrative agencies, there's all these job availabilities, and all of Frankfurter's best students are going into government. Um, this is the cover of Time Magazine, um, I think from 1938. Um, I can't remember the exact date. Um, these are two of, of, of Frankfurter's two prized um, former students, Ben Cohen, who um, went to University of Chicago Law School, but then did a master's degree with Frankfurt at Harvard and Tom Corcoran. And, and, and these two lawyers um, were, were really um, the two men who um, were um, the legal insiders for FDR. And they helped write the securities laws and, and were really um, doing a lot of heavy lifting, at, both as draftsmen um, and trying to get laws through Congress, working with members of Congress. Uh, and people thought they were super powerful um, that these two lawyers um, were really two of the most important people in Washington, D.C., um, which is why Time Magazine um, put them on the cover. 
big moment for Frankfurter and really for the country was when FDR um, tries to pack the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and um, Frank, FDR didn't tell Frankfurter about the court packing plan um, before he announced it, but he said, I have a big surprise for you. Um, withhold judgment um, until we have a chance to talk. And Frankfurter withholds judgment. He thinks the court packing plan is a really bad idea, even though he thinks the Supreme Court's really out of control and striking down minimum wage laws and FDR's New Deal programs. But FDR asks him to remain publicly neutral and to help him behind the scenes make the case against the current Supreme Court. And Frankfurter agrees. He doesn't agree out of some quid pro quo to get him on the Supreme Court. He agrees because he's deeply loyal to FDR, and he thinks that FDR is the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln, and he would do whatever it took to help FDR. And he hates the current that's, that Supreme Court of the United States, so he had no trouble helping FDR make the case against the court. But a lot of Frankfurter's friends criticized him for remaining publicly neutral about court packing because um, all of the reasons for court packing, one of them being that the justices were too old and behind on their work, were completely disingenuous. In 38, the Nazi rise has been happening for years. Frankfurter knows about it starting in 33 because he has contacts in Vienna. And he's helping get all these Jewish academics out of Germany, out of Austria, out of Europe. He's pleading with Francis Perkins and um, with Secretary of State um, Cordell Hull to let more Jewish refugees in the country. I do not know what he said to FDR because I don't have a record of it, but I know what he said to Francis Perkins and Cordell Hull who were in charge of immigration at the time um, to bring more Jewish refugees in the country. And then really the amazing moment was after the Anschluss in Austria, um, which were really a series of programs where Frankfurter's uncle, who again is one of the most prominent Jewish public intellectuals in the city of Vienna, he's thrown into a Nazi prison in his early 80s. And Frankfurter is desperate to get his uncle out of this prison. He refuses to go to FDR for help. Instead, he says he went to Lady Astor, who was this pro-Nazi leader of the Cliveden set in Britain, and she helped and she was friends with von Ribbentrop, and that he got her out. He got the uncle out. That's not what happened. What really happened is Frankfurter asked Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, to use his State Department contacts over in Austria to get, to get the uncle out. And this is a telegram from Cordell Hull to the attache, um, a, a man named Messersmith, who really got the uncle out of this Nazi prison. The uncle could have joined the rest of his family in the United States, but chose to live out his days under house arrest um, in his apartment in Vienna. Um, he was born in Austria and he wanted to die in Austria. And, and he eventually died um, in Austria in 1941, I think. And it was only then that Frankfurter sent his obituary um, to FDR. And, and FDR was flabbergasted. He said, why didn't you tell me about this? And Frankfurter said, I didn't want um, to be perceived as using special favors with the president to get my uncle um, out of Austria. 1939, Frankfurter gets nominated to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, he's the first Supreme Court nominee to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, Harlan Fistone briefly testified um, about a prosecution um, that he had I mean, he tried to prosecute a sitting United States Senator as Attorney General. He briefly had to testify about that, but Frankfurter, um, against his will, was caused to, was compelled to testify um, before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, there was a really nativist, anti-Semitic, anti-communist senator um, named Pat McCarran, um, who the airport's named after, um, in Las Vegas, um, and um, and he was really um antagonistic toward Frankfurter. And there were all these crazy people who were allowed to testify um, at Frankfurter's um, Supreme Court nomination hearing. This is Elizabeth Dilling. She was from Chicago. She, she basically spent her entire life um, crusading against communists um, and trying to um, ferret out communists in the federal government. Um, she got herself in trouble during this hearing by accusing FDR, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, 
and several members of the Senate Judiciary Committee of being communists, um, along with Felix Frankfurter. Um, so she wasn't a really effective um, advocate. At the same time, here's what the Nazi newspapers were saying um, about Felix Frankfurter. Um, they basically pilloried this nomination that showed that FDR had been captured by the Jews. Um, and there were people in the United States, this really shocked me in my research. Um, there were German Jews, mostly in New York, who were very wealthy, who urged FDR not to nominate Frankfurter because they were afraid of exactly this type of backlash. And those German Jews um, were Arthur Sulzberger, um, the publisher of the New York Times, um, and Henry Morgenthau Sr., um, who basically told Roosevelt not to nominate Frankfurter because they were afraid of these type of cartoons. Frankfurter goes on the court in 1939, um, he's expected to be the liberal leader of the court. It doesn't work out that way. Um, he spends most of his war years um, really violating separation of powers um, and advising FDR about how to win the war. Um, he encouraged FDR um, to make Henry Stimson, his old mentor, secretary of war, and FDR does um, before war breaks out. Um, and Frankfurter's way too involved in wartime policy making. Today, he would be um, impeached in a hot minute um, for advising the executive branch while sitting on the Supreme Court of the United States. But I think what Frankfurter would say is that the ends justified the means, um, that it wasn't clear that the Nazis weren't going to take over the world, and he was going to do um, anything in his power to save um, the United States. Um, and the world from uh, what he really saw was a war to save civilization. Frankfurter also took in three British students, three British children of a former student, um, and saved them from the Blitz. Um, this is the youngest of those three children um, that he took in. This is Oliver Gates. I had the great pleasure of interviewing Oliver Gates and staying at his home um, before he died, and by really relying on a trove of letters um, between the Frankfurters and the Gateses um, during the Blitz. Frankfurter's loss of liberal leadership really comes in a 1943 case um, called um, West Virginia versus Barnett, um, where he dissented and thought that they should upheld, uphold um, a compulsory flag salute um, against children um, of Jehovah's Witnesses. And at this point, he was basically kind of written off um, by the left wing of the court as a liberal lawyer turned conservative justice. I totally reject um, that um, Frankfurter was liberal on race um, throughout his career on the court in 1944. Um, this is an unpublished concurrence. I mean, a case striking down Alabama's all white primary. Frankfurter was supposed to write the majority opinion, but they took it away from him because they didn't want a Jew from Massachusetts um, telling Alabama um, not to have all white primaries um, anymore. Um, in 1948, um, Frankfurter hired the first African-American law clerk. Um, that's William T. Coleman, um, the future Secretary of Transportation on the left. Um, on the right um, is um, the future Attorney General and, and Coleman's former roommate at Harvard Law School, Elliot Richardson, um, who resigned during the Saturday Night Massacre. In 48, Frankfurter hasn't stopped um, engaging in um, executive branch policymaking. Um, he has two um, protégés working for Truman, Max Lowenthal, and David Niles. And, and through Lowenthal and Niles, Frankfurter gets the Truman administration to be the first country in the world um, to recognize the state of Israel. Um, Frankfurter writes Niles, um, if only Brandeis had been alive um, to see um, uh, the United States um, be the first country to recognize the state of Israel. Brandeis, of course, um, died a few years earlier. Um, and um, so, uh, the night before um, or Chaim Weitzman comes to the White House after this U.S. recognition, um, he meets with Frankfurter. Um, he's so physically ill that Weitzman doesn't speak, um, that he and Frankfurter just meet and just talk. Um, they'd known each other since um, 19, the, the teens, 1915, 1916. Um, they had first met, and they were allies ever since. Um, I, one of the funny moments on this meeting was Chaim Weitzman gave Harry Truman a Torah as a gift. And Truman blurts out, oh, a Torah, I always wanted one. And Dave Niles, um, his um, Jewish aide um, in the White House, burst out laughing um, when Truman uh, said that. Frankfurter is instrumental 
1954 in helping a new Chief Justice Earl Warren on the right um, achieve an unanimous result in what, for, in my um, opinion, is the most important case of the 20th century, um, Brown versus Board of Education, striking down racially separate but equal um, state um, public schools. Um, and Frankfurter and Hugo Black both helped um, Earl Warren, um, who was not even confirmed until April of 1954. He was a recess appointment, um, navigate this really tricky process. Um, and But at that point, he began to part company with the Warren court after Brown, because um, the Warren court um, in reaching liberal results started to um, empower itself by claiming that the judiciary had the last word on the constitution. The first place they did this was a 1958 case called Cooper versus Aaron. And in that case, it was a, a famous case involving um, Arkansas segregationist governor Orville Faubus um, trying to disobey a federal court order to um, continue the desegregation of Little Rock's public schools after Eisenhower had brought in the 101st Airborne to, um, to force um, Faubus to integrate Little Rock Central High School. They wanted to continue with that desegregation plan. Um, the Supreme Court wrote that the federal judiciary is supreme in the exposition in the law of the Constitution. Frankfurter really rejected that. He really thought that um, he wrote a concurring opinion here that annoyed all of his colleagues that said, no, this is not about the Supreme Court having the last word on the Constitution. This is about the rule of law. And this is about um, a state governor um, respecting federal law. It has nothing to do with who has the last word on the meaning of the Constitution. This opposition to judicial supremacy um, really comes to a head. And, um, you know, with Warren in, in opposition to really the three men to the Earl Warren's on the left, um, there's Learned Hand, the famous Second Circuit judge in the middle, um, Felix Frankfurter, his close friend, Hand's close friend um, to the right of Hand, and then John Harlem II, who was Frankfurter's ally and in favor of judicial restraint on the far right. Um, they really rejected this idea of judicial supremacy. Um, it came to a head in a case called Baker versus Carr, um, which was about um, the state of Tennessee's failure to reapportion its state representatives for 60 years. And in the majority opinion by Justice William Brennan, Frankfurter's former student at Harvard, the Supreme Court declares itself the ultimate interpreter of the Constitution, right? I just want to give you a little hint. There's nowhere in the Constitution that says that the Supreme Court is the ultimate interpreter. The court's only support for that idea is Marbury versus Madison. And a single line in Marbury versus Madison about the court's power to say what the law is. If you read that line, in its historical, political, and legal context, it does not mean what Baker versus Carr says it means. Um, the Supreme Court in Marbury versus Madison was deferring to the Jefferson administration. It was really not in a position of power in the way it was in Baker versus Carr. Frankfurter dissents from Baker versus Carr. He thinks the Supreme Court is entering what he calls the political thicket of electoral politics, which the Supreme Court is better off staying out of. After Baker versus Carr gets decided, Frankfurter has a stroke um, in April of 1962. Um, at the end of that summer, um, he is replaced by Arthur Goldberg um, as um, the fourth Jewish justice on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, Frankfurter throughout his life had an enormous impact beyond um, his judicial decisions. He knew every um, American president from Theodore Roosevelt um, to um, John F. Kennedy. Um, this is a picture um, with Frankfurter after his stroke um, in the Oval Office um, with Kennedy. Um, he advised every American president um, from um, all the way through to Lyndon Johnson. Um, he, he really thought that Lyndon Johnson um, was, a, he was not a huge um, JFK fan. He thought he was a lightweight and he, he hated Kennedy's father, who was a huge anti-Semite and was spreading a lot of anti-Semitic um, hate about Frankfurter during the New Deal, but he loved LBJ. And he, um, he thought LBJ was a master legislator and um, LBJ went to Frankfurter's house, um, as did um, JFK, um, to meet with Frankfurter and to get his ideas about how to govern. And this is a picture of LBJ in 1965, um, walking out of Frankfurter's apartment building. Um, behind him is Dean Acheson, um, Frankfurter's closest friend and former student, and of course, 
um, Truman's um, Secretary of State. Um, so my book has kind of two big ideas in it, and I'll wrap up and stop sharing my screen and then take questions. Um, the two big ideas are really this. One, Frankfurter believed that judicial restraint was a liberal constitutional theory, and he really rejected this idea of the Supreme Court having the last word of the Constitution. He believed that Congress, not the Supreme Court of the United States, um, was better at protecting minority rights and, and that we should leave the legislating and the policy making to Congress. And I think he was vindicated in some ways um, by LBJ passing the 1964 Civil Rights Act, by LBJ passing the 1965 um, Voting Rights Act. And if you look at how the Supreme Court of the United States has really undermined the enforcement of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 um, Voting Rights Act, I really think Frankfurter's been vindicated on that score. Frankfurter's second big cons um, contribution was in really um, teaching generations of Harvard Law students that their highest possible calling was public service and particularly service in the federal government. Um, he had um, law clerks or former students in every administration from Woodrow Wilson to Jimmy Carter. And, and that's just a remarkable um, influence on, on government service. And, and so um, I, I think those two things um, really, uh, and his incredible rise from age 11, not speaking a word of English, um, to age 23, um, being on a first name basis on um, with Theodore Roosevelt, you kind of can't make that stuff up. Um, with with all that, um, I will open the floor to questions. Frankfurter certainly had a lot of flaws. I'm happy to discuss that. I'm also happy to discuss the current Supreme Court. That's my day job. So if you have anything um, that's on the front of your mind about the current court, about certain justices, um, I'm, I'm happy um, to answer any of those questions as well. <laughs> So first, Brad, um, in the chat is a link to your book. <clears throat> you can go to Amazon or the book stall in Winnetka if you want to do an indie place. Uh, but I encourage you all to get this book. Um, and um, I think as the moderator, I'm going to take the first question. Uh, if Frankfurter were, to, were alive, what would he say about the status of uh, the Supreme Court in 2023? Well, like a good law professor, um, Vanessa, I'm going to um, rearrange your question a little bit. So <laughs> I, I think the, the most common question I get was, well, what would Frankfurter have done with Roe versus Wade, right? Because mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade um, was based on um, the due process clause and the liberty provision of the due process clause. And Frankfurter hated the due process clause and hated the use of the liberty provision to strike down minimum wage and ma maximum hour laws. So would he have been in dissent? And Roe versus Wade. I think the better question would have been, would he have overturned Roe versus Wade um, after um, after 50 years? And the answer is a hard no, right? Um, Frankfurter really clashed with a lot of his Warren court colleagues because um, he wanted to um, respect precedent more than they did. Not when it came to Plessy versus Ferguson or, or things that made Black people second-class citizens, but he thought that the Warren Court was overturning too many precedents and that the precedents were really a check on the court's power. And, and in that sense, Frankfurter is a lot like Elena Kagan, who's on the court today, um, who's really a strong believer in following precedent. And so I, I just think um, he would have agreed with Kagan that the court's overturning precedent left and right um, for not really any clear textual reasons and, and not really any, um, not really reconsidering the meaning of the Constitution, but just because they have the votes. And, and that's sort of what he told his Warren Court colleagues not to do. He said he, I think, saw that the Warren Court was kind of a liberal fluke, that for the most part during our history, that the court had been um, conservative um, compared to the other branches of government. And so, um, I think he really would have been in dissent. He would have been horrified by Shelby County versus Holder gutting the Voting Rights Act, right? He would have been horrified by any of the Roberts Court decisions striking down federal laws and striking down agency actions um, in ways um, th that aren't based on the text of the Constitution. Okay. Um, other questions? Yeah, the Schubert's. Okay. 
I have to, I believe I saw um, a documentary on Ruth Bader Ginsburg back uh, before she was famous. Uh, and she felt apprehensive about Roe versus Wade because she thought that really was something that uh, should be done by Congress. And it, it sounds like this is very similar to uh, Frankfurter's views. And then my, my question is, uh, how do you view term limits on the Supreme Court, like 18 years or something? So first of all, on Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, she spent her first two years at Harvard Law School. She graduated from Columbia. And, and um, one of her old Harvard Law professors tried to get Frankfurter to hire her, and he refused. And I had a really neat opportunity um, to be in her chambers and to show her the letters that went back and forth um, between Frankfurt and the Harvard law and the Harvard law professor. And, um, and she said, yeah, it's typical white male chauvinism was what she told me. And um, but it was really neat to be able to see um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's real time reaction to that correspondence. And um, Frankfurter said his, his reasons for rejecting Ruth Bader Ginsburg were ridiculous. Um, he, he said, well, I had a heart attack in 58 and um, my doctor told me to simplify my life and I can't have a law clerk whose husband is dying of testicular cancer because at the time Marty Ginsburg um, had testicular cancer with a young child. I can't have that kind of stress in my chambers. And the other thing he told his law clerks was I curse too much. Well, he doesn't curse at all in chambers. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, it, he really made a huge blunder in not hiring her. And if he had, um, it would have been as monumental or even more monumental um, and then hiring um, William T. Coleman back in 1948. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have been um, the second female law clerk on, on the Supreme Court. Um, but yeah, I, I think he and, and and I think RBG's point was that the court in Roe versus Wade bit off a little more than it could chew. That if it had taken a more incremental approach, right, um, rather than try to solve the whole issue of abortion rights um, in 1973, um, that it would have been better. And I think she also thought that Roe versus Wade undermined um, the gains she was making under the Equal Protection Clause um, for women's rights. And I think Frankfurter, like RBG, would have been very sympathetic to an equal protection argument about the way abortion rights um, make women equal citizens and that denying women abortion rights make them second class citizens and violate the Equal Protection Clause. And I think that a more incremental approach would have allowed those ideas to develop. I think that was really RBG's point. Um, remind me of your second question besides RBG and Roe v. Wade. Uh, the term limits, like 18 years, I've heard. Totally damage. in favor. Totally <laughs> in favor. I think the court packing thing is a pipe dream. But the Constitution says that the justices sit for good behavior. It doesn't say life tenure. It says for good behavior. And I think Congress is well within its power to be able to define what good behavior means, not just with a set of a canon of judicial ethics, which are badly needed um, based on everything we've learned in the last few weeks um, about justices accepting money um, from um, high-powered donors, um, but also... I mean, I, I think term limits would be a great thing of 18 to 20 years, one non-renewable 18, 20 year term for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, I think it would take a lot of um, the political steam out of the confirmation process, um, which are out of control. Um, you know, I feel like it's a one way ratchet kind of tit for tat between the Democrats and the Republicans in the confirmation process. And they just keep getting worse and worse and figuring out worse and worse things to do to each other. The other thing I think it would do is it would um, encourage presidents to nominate justices who've actually done something with their lives before getting on the Supreme Court and not just having um, these really young professional judges serve as justices. Um, and I mean that in a bipartisan way um, <laughs> uh, because if you look at the court that Frankfurter served on, Hugo Black was a United States senator. Earl Warren was the governor of New York. William O. Douglas, although appointed the court very young, was the chair of the SEC. Frankfurter um, had been in and out of a bunch of different presidential administrations, advised FDR, TR, Taft, and Wilson. So these people had done something with their lives. And I just think we have this kind of incentive with life tenure to appoint 40 somethings to the Supreme Court who don't know much law um, other than being judges. And, and that if we had judges um, with a more diverse experience, I think we only have 
two members of the court with executive branch experience, maybe three, I think Kagan, Roberts, and, and Kavanaugh were all um, in, served in the executive branch. But for the most part, except for Kagan, every single one of the current justices served on a lower federal court. And that's just not the way it was in Frankfurter's time. And I think we had better judges then. One of my favorite judges that Frankfurter served with was Harold Burton, who was the mayor of Cleveland and the senator from Ohio before he got on the court. And I, I just think we need more judges with life experiences in other branches of government, like the legislature and like the executive branch, because then we would have a Supreme Court, which is less hostile to the democratic political process. Here, here. Wait, wait, wait. I just have a thought. Did you say you think it's a legislative process and, and it doesn't need a, an amendment? I don't think you need an amendment because the Constitution says good behavior. And I think that I think Congress, um, which is in, in charge with them, um, with defining the lower courts, um, I, I think Congress could do it without. I think they would have to make it prospective. But I think Congress could do it without an amendment. What happens when it gets up to the Supreme Court to be? Well, the, they kind of have a conflict there, don't they? Right. They have a conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that would be an interesting one. But, you know, I, I think if you make it prospective, so the current justices aren't limited to 18 to 20 years, and so it's sort of phased in, mm -hmm. so every new justice is going to be, and every new, I would make all federal judges 18 to 20 year terms. I just told a federal judge to his face a couple of weekends ago, and he did not like it. Um, so <laughs> Of course um, not. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I, I think it'd be great for the entire federal judiciary, and I definitely think that Congress is within its power to do it for the federal judiciary. I think it in no way interferes with federal judicial independence. Um, from Arthur Early. Can, can I just uh, say one more thing? Yeah. Uh, and I, I see I, I see the question in the chat. I'll I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll answer them all. Good. I just think the justices are staying on the court way too long. Um, that's um, true of um, William Rehnquist um, when he and basically stayed on the Supreme Court until he died of throat cancer. That's true of RBG. And that's true of another judge I really admire from Chicago, John Paul Stevens, right? Um, I just think they were on the court for too long. And um, and, and, it, and more turnover would be better. It would depoliticize um, the whole process. So the, the questions I have in the chat is it appears that the conservative justice claim to also use judicial restraint, but for different motives. So I were wondering about what your thoughts are about that. I don't think the justices are conservative justices are using judicial restraint at all. Um, to me, the definition of judicial restraint is not overturning state and federal laws. And, and I see the justices overturning federal laws all the time. And they do so for two, two reasons. One, um, they, they, they claim to be using the interpreting the original meaning of the Constitution. And secondly, sometimes um, they say that um, structural reasons like separation of powers um, make them um, need to overturn the, uh, but I don't see any restraint at all. This, another definition of judicial restraint is respect for precedent. And I don't see any respect for precedent out of this current court. Um, you know, except for Kagan, um, none of the justices seem to care about precedent. So um, I, I don't see the conservative justice claiming judicial restraint. In fact, um, you know, if you read conservative law professors, as I do, and the people who are really influencing this, the conservative justices, um, like my really esteemed colleague, Randy Barnett um, from Chicago, um, he, he is calling for judicial engagement, not judicial restraint by the Supreme Court. So he's, he's calling for a form of judicial activism, not restraint. Um, William Rosen asks, where do we go with instituting a code of ethics for the Supreme Court justice? I mean, look, I don't blame the court for this lack of judicial ethics. I don't even blame Clarence Thomas. I blame Dianne Feinstein for not retiring from the Supreme from the United States Senate when she is not capable physically of doing the job. I blame, you know, the Democrats who had control of the House and Senate um, for not passing a code of ethics, which they could have easily done. And to me, tomorrow, what should happen is Dianne Feinstein needs to resign. Um, the California go governor of California needs to appoint a temporary replacement, and the judiciary needs to subpoena uh, 
Clarence Thomas, Jimmy, Ginny Thomas, Harlan Crow, Leonard Leo, and Chief Justice John Glover Roberts about a code of judicial ethics. But until that, right, people's beef shouldn't be with the justices themselves. It should be with our lawmakers for not doing their jobs. Um, yeah, I think Chief Justice Roberts uh, should have accepted the invitation. And if I were Chief Justice Roberts, I'd be working with Congress behind the scenes to craft a code of judicial ethics, because I think that the that Roberts is pretty politically savvy and, um, and, and that he should want to have a say in what this code of judicial ethics says. Um, so I, I think he could have, should have done it. Um, but I, I think some of the problem with some of these hearings is sometimes it's too much theater and not enough substance. So I could see why Roberts might want to wait for a subpoena rather than just to allow a couple of members of Congress to grandstand about, um, about Clarence Thomas and judicial ethics. By the way, I don't think this is limited to Clarence Thomas. So um, I think if you look deep in all of the nine justices, I think you would find them accepting gifts from rich people across the political spectrum. So, you know, I, I'm not, I just don't think Roberts wanted to take the fire um, that, that um, really belonged to Clarence and Jimmy, Ginny Thomas and Harlan Crow. Um, I don't think he, should be the first person to testify. I think Congress has an oversight function and they should use it. And, and they can't use it in the House right now because it's controlled by the Republicans, but they should be able to use it um, in the Senate. So I would subpoena all those folks um, that ProPublica and the Washington Post have been writing articles about. Well, anybody you, else? You've given us a lot to think about. Don't forget to go out and get the book. And, um, there's just so much going on. This was so fascinating today. I can only thank you. Any last questions? Okay. Uh, wow. I've got one. Alice, do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, Alice, let me unmute you. Oh, Go I'm ahead, sorry. Alice. Go okay, ahead. Thanks. This is more, uh, well, something that I'd like for you to comment on. I, I heard something this morning. I was watching uh, Meet the Press that it kind of, my mouth dropped open. Um, Chuck Todd was interviewing Asa Hutchinson. Yeah. And they were talking about the court and he said something like, and, and, and I'm not quoting exactly, but he said something like, well, Brown versus Board of Education where it was a very controversial um, decision and kind of like how we have controversial decisions now. And I was thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> Brown versus Board of Education was a landmark decision that you know gave rights to all these people. I, I it just sort of, it and well, it bothered me that Chuck Todd really didn't question him about it. Like, what what do you mean that that was controversial? Because I feel that Brown versus Board of, Board of Education is so different from some of the decisions that are coming out of the court now that are taking rights away from people. So well, Alice, I think you kind of hit the na nail on the head. <laughs> First of all, it's kind of rich that Aza Hutchinson the former governor of Arkansas, that was the sort of place where we had to bring in the military to enforce Brown v. Board. Eisenhower had to bring in the U.S. military to enforce Brown v. Board. And also, if you notice, Aza Hutchinson went to Bob Jones University, which gave up its nonprofit status in a famous Supreme Court case so it could continue to discriminate on the basis of race and to ban things like interracial relationships, it's a little rich for mm -hmm. uh, Aza Hutchinson um, to invoke B Brown versus Board of Education. But I think your point is better than mine, which is <laughs> you don't often see the Supreme Court of the United States taking away rights from a large segment of the population with the way they took away rights. But this goes back to what I said at the beginning. Um, my Wisconsin students would always push back and say, um, we need the Supreme Court of the United States to protect minority rights. That's why the Supreme Court should have the last word on the Constitution. But my pushback with them, you know, in, in you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, take a longer view of history. The Supreme Court hasn't done a really good job with protecting rights. The people's, you know, not a lot of people, um, there was not a lot of desegregation that happened as a result of Brown versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Most of the action started to happen when Congress Threat took away federal funding 
to any school that refused to desegregate in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And not a lot really started to happen until the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So, you know, if you compare institutions, who's better at protecting individual rights? I'd take to Congress every time. I know they're not perfect. I know there's gerrymandering. I know the Senate's flawed. But if you just say, well, who's better at doing this? The court or the Congress, right? My hope is that long term um, that we get a sort of federal law that const that constitutionalizes abortion um, through the Congress, like we got the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and, and dare the Supreme Court of the United States to strike that down. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I just so agree with everything you say. And Bill said he wishes he could take um, <laughs> one of your courses. Um, I have um, Sue, go ahead and unmute. Thanks, Vanessa. I have a, first of all, Brad, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I have a question. I'm not a lawyer, but I thought originally when all this stuff started about 2024, that you couldn't run for presidency if you had, um, what do we call it, a uh, federal offense, right? Or what, an indictment. What, an indictment, right, but also but found guilty. And it sounds like when you go back in the three things that are um, requirements to run for president, it doesn't matter if you have right. legal issues. Can you talk right. about what's going on? Oh, boy. So... Um, <laughs> My parents' friends always ask me because they live in Florida, which is like a hotbed of, of, of support for Trump and DeSantis. Like, what do you think of Donald Trump? I'm like, well, he keeps me in business and he makes <laughs> my class super exciting. Is my kind of one response I have. Um, you know, I don't see. I think even if Trump got convicted, I think he could still run for president, right? I think it would. Um, you know, I don't think a conviction is going to stop him from running for president. I think you're right, Susan. Like, you know, the requirements are United States citizenship, 35 years old. And, you know, I, I think he meets the requirements to be president. The only thing that can keep him from becoming president again is a second term, right? One, if he served a second term, then he'd be done, right? But in the Constitution, but I, I don't think a conviction would stop him from being president. I, I think um, if he got criminally convicted as opposed to, um, losing his civil case in New York. Um, I think it would damage him as a presidential candidate, but I don't think it would prevent him from running. I guess I was surprised that that wasn't a requirement, like that that our country allows you to run for president if you've been convicted. I was I was shocked. I didn't realize Well, that. there's a federal judge, Elsie Hastings, who was impeached and convicted of bribery who is now serving in Congress in the great state of Florida. So, you know, be that as what, take that for what you will, right? So um, here's somebody who the Senate convicted and removed him from his federal judgeship. And then he turned around and he ran for Congress. So, um, you know, that's what makes our democracy interesting. People should just go vote. Yes, vote, vote. That's what we, at the end of every adult enrichment, that's what we say, vote. Um, Denny, I saw you came. Did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, great, great conversation this morning. And uh, get out there and vote. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.